What's that? Oh yeah, no, 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 no. That's that's the only right place to put the dock, actually. <laughs> All right. So, uh, my name is Michael Bevelakwalin, and I'm a software architect with Comcast Interactive Media. Uh, so we do all Comcast's uh, online and mobile stuff. Uh, and you know, what that means is we produce a fairly sort of high volume uh, website and you know, a bunch of APIs that power that website and uh, mobile apps and stuff. And what I was going to say now was, well, we're not as big as Google or Facebook. And then it turns out that Facebook is actually presenting at the same time as I am. So that's unfortunate. But you know, thanks for coming to this. Uh, so. <clears throat> Uh, when we start building a, a new system, you know, we obviously make a bunch of assumptions. And I'd say that we make uh, one, one big assumption, right? And, and, and a lot of times, well, not always, but a lot of times we'll make one big assumption, uh, which is that the data we're dealing with isn't going to fit in memory, uh, which a lot of times is true. Uh, I think increasingly, you know, it no longer is, right? This assumption that our data just isn't going to fit in memory. Uh, but where does that lead us to? Uh, one old place it's led us to is just sort of three-tier architecture, right? We got a presentation, a business, and a data layer. Uh, it's old hat for everyone, I'm sure. Um, and another place, you know, from there is this sort of services-oriented architecture. When we try and uh, sort of, you know, take that and sort of scale it out to a bunch of little services we can all scale independently and work with independently and, and that sort of thing. So. Uh, doing that right is actually really, really hard, right? Doing SOA right is actually really, really hard, and uh, you know, actually, uh, various talks have discussed various reasons why that's true. Uh, you know, one is you've sort of got like different tiers of services, <clears throat> and the top layer ones depend on the lower layer ones. So that means a few things, right? First of all, it means that uh, your SLAs on the top layer ones are bounded by your SLAs on the lower layer ones, right? Uh, you can only return something as fast as the slowest service that you know, needs to be called out to. Uh, another one is, you know, if you're calling out to 10 services, what do you do if nine of them respond and the 10th doesn't? How do you handle partial failures? That's something you got to think about. Uh, if you're calling out to 10 services, which ones can you do concurrently and which ones can't you? Because right? if you're calling out to those 10 services, you definitely don't want to do them sequentially or you know, the, sort of your latency is at the, at the highest layer. just going to be completely unacceptable. So doing this right is actually really, really hard. Uh, it can be done, but it's very, very difficult. Uh, and you know people do it, but much of the pain that you you know much of the pain you experience every day comes from trying to build this this sort of really highly distributed architecture, which is sort of trivially true, but true nonetheless. So, uh, and in, in real life, uh, it's even it's even more difficult than that because most real life systems are this sort of chimera. That's a chimera. I'm actually not sure what the other thing is with antlers, but it's a lion and something else. So they're this chimera, right? That mashes together these sort of three tier things and. Uh, you know, SOA things, right? Nothing, no, nobody ever gets all the way to SOA, or very, very few people do. So they still have some stuff that's going out to the database, and they still have some stuff that's going out to services, and they tend to fail in different ways, and it, you know, makes your life uh, unpleasant. It's not fun. So, uh, here's an observation, <clears throat> right? Which is that uh, main memory obviously grows uh, exponentially. Uh, so here, and this is actually, what this is, it's, it's uh, on the left there was the amount of memory you could get in a PDP-11 in, you know, like 1976. Uh, and actually, it was 64 kilobits was the amount of memory that a PDP-11 could address. Which, so that's not even, you know, that's what it could address. Um, and then on the other side, I've got what I claim is a mid-grade server that has 16 gigabytes of memory. I just picked that sort of arbitrarily. I mean, depends on what you want to call a mid-grade server. But, you know, a server with 16 gigabytes of memory is nothing unusual, right? What's that? Yes, right. Yeah, you can have a laptop with that. Um, <clears throat> You know, so I claim that's mid-grade, I don't know, whatever. Uh, maybe 32 gigabytes is. But anyway, point being, like, that's, that's a huge difference. That's, uh, let's see, 262, well, whatever that number is. It's big. Um, <clears throat> so that's interesting, right? And then if you look at, like, other interesting data sets, they just don't grow nearly that fast. This is pulled from our internal data source. Uh, and it's all the movies, all, like, sort of the Hollywood and, and some other movies uh, in the world uh, from the same time period. And that increased about four times, as opposed to that whatever that giant number was before. Um, so, so, yeah, obviously that grows much, much slower. So, uh, you know, just the, the rates that you, when you compare this sort of, you know, movies is, uh, it, I'm going to say that's more or less linear, or maybe it's two different lines, but it's it, kind of linear. 
And then main memory is exponential. Um, you know, so, so obviously we can fit more and more interesting data sets uh, purely into memory, and that's not shocking, right? A lot of people are doing it, but I think still, you know, what, what that means is as you start, sort of start building new systems, like that's one thing you really need to think about, right? You, you need to think about, wait a minute, what's the data I'm dealing with? Uh, is there some interesting domain that fits purely into memory? Because if you can do that, you're gonna make your life a lot easier. Uh, so, so let's bring this to a thought experiment, right? Where we've taken that three tier thing uh, and you know, the presentation layer for us is usually a web browser, right? Uh, and then the business layer is you know, some code, Java, Ruby, whatever. And then you've got a database and that's maybe a traditional relational database or maybe a non-relational one. Um, you know, any one of the umpteen newer non-relational ones. Um, so what happens if we, uh, let's not consider the presentation layer because that's not gonna change, it's the browser. Um, you know, so we've got those two boxes and what happens if you just kind of jam them together, right? What does that look like? Uh, if you put your data layer and your business uh, layer like back together, because that's where we started, right? I mean, years and years and years ago, um, there were no databases, right? People just built systems, right? And they had memory, and they had a processor, and you processed data with them. Uh, and that's probably how you started programming as well. No, nobody woke up and said, gee, you know, I really want to connect to an Oracle database, and, right? Uh, well, uh, if somebody has, I don't want to meet them. Um, so so this, this is good for some reasons, right? Uh, obviously, this is fast. We're serving everything out of memory. Uh, it's simple, right? It's, it's like the simplest possible thing you can do. You just got some in-memory data structures and then you've got like HTTP requests coming in and you're serving those requests directly out of some code built on in-memory data structures, right? That's the simplest possible thing you could do. Um, and you've only got one round trip, like one network round trip. Like I've noticed one running theme here has been like, wow, networking is hard, which it is, right? There's a lot of, like, there's a lot of things that can go wrong. All right, and that's of course a lie, the one round trip, uh, you know, because it takes several round trips to, but you know, my point is like once you, you, you know, you don't actually have to call out to some other services below it and you know, do a, a whole bunch of other networking, um, right? So, all right, let's get rid of that thought experiment and say, why can't we do this? Oh, that was supposed to be grayer, oh well. Anyway, that's grayed out, pretend it's not there. Uh, so, the bad, right? This is why we can't, we can't do this. Uh, it's not durable, right? I mean, our data's just sitting there in memory. Uh, there's a single point of failure. Everything's on this one node, right? And that implies that we can't scale it out horizontally, right? So, uh, so obviously, you know, we can't build systems like this much as we would like to, right? But we can tackle these things one by one. All right, and if we want to persist our data, uh, for some problems, it is enough to just do this, to create a, a, a log, right, a transaction log, much as a database would do, of that, data, or right, of the request coming into the system. So for us, those requests would be something like, hey, we've got a new video, right, and it, it's, uh, it's of the Daily Show, right? Jam that into your system, right? So it's enough to just create a, a log of those requests, and those are sort of very, uh, you know, sort of business-centric things, right? They have meaning to the business. Uh, a new video was added, a new movie was added, a new TV series, uh, that sort of thing, right? So you, you create a write-ahead log uh, that just has that in it. All right, so now it's on disk. Right, durability is good. Um, but now what do we do with it, right? One problem is that that's gonna grow without bound. Um, so one thing we could do obviously is, all right, we've, we've got that write ahead log and then we've got this stuff in memory so we could start snapshotting that to disk, but that's actually difficult and there's a lot to think about there. So what if we do this instead? We just, we figure out a, a way to uh, sort of compact the log such that it's fast enough for us to, when we restart a node, we just slurp that log in. And that's, that's our durability. Uh, so there's an interesting, way to do this, which is if you constrain yourself to like HTTP semantics, puts and deletes, or sorry, things that are idempotent in HTTP, puts, puts and deletes, uh, there's a very, very easy way to compact the log and that's you just take the last one, right? Because everything's idempotent and that last one is going to have the current state of, you know, whatever that thing you just did was. So you can compact your log like that. Um, and for certain problems, this is enough. And for ours, it's enough because we're talking about things like, hey, you know, new videos and new movies and and like new TV series and that sort of stuff coming into the system, and and that's a low enough like rate of transactions and and just a, a low enough uh, a low enough number of total things we have in the system that you know we're talking about uh, you know millions and we've got a, so we can compact the log to be something that's 
on the order of like, you know, millions of things long, and we can slurp that into memory in minutes, which is good enough since, you know, all we need to do that is, is when we start the system. So that's good enough for durability. Um, but what about the other two, right? So we were talking about we've got the single point of failure, and we've also got, uh, you know, this, we, can't, we can't scale it out horizontally. If we want to make a, a bigger one, we need to buy a bigger box, which you can only get boxes that are so big and it gets expensive, and everybody knows that's bad. So uh, we're talking about building a distributed system now, right? Which looks something like this, where we've got a bunch of nodes that have this sort of brain, right? Uh, which has the business and the, the sort of business logic and the data in it, and they all have uh, a copy of this log, right? And what this comes down to is, okay, building a distributed write-ahead log, which is a very, very well understood thing, right? It's very, very well understood how to do this. Everybody, well, not, not everybody, but all the database people have done this, and there's a lot of literature out there on how to do it, and it's actually, it's like, it's doable, right? It, it's not that difficult, um, right? You have fault tolerance, and you can scale horizontally, and it's still not trivial, right? It's still not trivial, um, but it's not as hard as it would have been like 10 years ago or 15 years ago, um, because there's just there's there's all these tools out there for doing this. There's Akka, um, and there's things like uh, you know there's just all sorts of tools for doing this. And and there's even more. There's all this knowledge out there. There's all the papers that Google's written and all sorts of other academic papers um, <clears throat> that make this like a, a fairly doable thing to just do yourself, right? Uh, all right, so how do we, how do we go at building this, right? Um, okay. Uh, kind of like this, at a very, very high level. Um, so by the way, we call this system Sirius, which I probably should have mentioned earlier. Uh, you build a library that's responsible primarily for doing just that, for building that distributed write-ahead log, right? And as a request comes into a node on your system, you jam it into that library. That library decides on the total, or, total ordering of requests coming into the, the whole system, right? And once that's happened, right, that takes a bunch of network trip, you know, network round trips and a bunch of stuff happens there. Uh, but once that's happened, once that has actually decided on the total ordering of the request in the log, it gets passed on to some bit of application specific request handling code on every node, which then goes and does whatever needs doing. So for us to go back to sort of the adding a video example, uh, this would be, hey, we've added a video to the system, um, well, what does that mean we need to do? Uh, we need to add it to some data structure that's keyed off of the video's ID so we can pull it out by its ID. Uh, maybe we also need to add it to some data structure that's keyed off of uh, you know, a movie ID that belongs to it, right? So that way we know that these are all the videos uh, that belong to Inglorious Bastards. Uh, you know, we've got a full length thing and then we've got you know, some interviews with the casting crew and whatever. Um, and uh, you know, some other stuff. So, so sort of, you know, at this point you're just organizing your data in the way it needs to be organized so that it's fast uh, to, to pull it out when you actually get to the reading part. And what the reading part looks like is you just go and you pull it out of local memory on the node. You don't actually talk to any other nodes, right? Uh, so at a really high level, that's what we did. Um, how's time for some code? But before I get into that, uh, so a little bit more detail about how we built it. We built this in Akka uh, and Scala um, because it turns out to be a, a pretty good way of, of um, building distributed systems, the sort of actor model that you, know, you might have heard of from Erlang and you know, React is built on top of. It's very similar. Um, and then we ended up just sort of designing our own log format that just you know, spits out a binary log to disk and uh, an index file so it can read that entire thing on, uh, read that entire thing in uh, when the node starts up and you can actually uh, pick stuff out of that log uh, uh, in constant time, um, which ends up being handy for uh, sort of a catch-up algorithm, right? If, if one of the nodes falls behind, it needs to ask another node, oh, hey, you know, give me the stuff that happened from, you know, request 100 to request, uh, you know, 105 or whatever. So being able to actually index into that log is important quickly. Um, so let's take a look at some of the code. All right, starting with, uh, ah, I like, yeah, that's pretty good. That's good, right? Okay, I can get rid of some of these things. This thing, get rid of, uh, oh, yeah, doing that. Get rid of all that, okay, and we don't actually even wanna look at that one right now. All right, so, Nope, I want to look at that. Ah, crap. 
out where I stashed these things. Okay, so I'm actually going to show you guys uh, the, the API here. Um, so the, the sort of central bit, like, like when you actually spin up a system that's using this, uh, this is the main entry point to the distributed library. Uh, it's called Sirius. Uh, this, is, uh, this is Akka, by the way. Uh, sorry, not Akka. This is Scala, by the way, and this is uh, uh, basically a definition of an interface. Uh, it's got uh, three things on it, right? Uh, in queue a get, in queue a put, and in queue a delete. Uh, so kind of as simple as you can get. Um, and then what those keys are, they don't actually imply like key value semantics, uh, but what they are is you can think of them as like part of a, a part of a URL that would be in a service somewhere. So the key would be something like slash video slash one two three for you know video one two three or you know movie slash one for movie one that sort of thing. Um, but you know again that doesn't imply key value semantics because uh, putting something into the system would actually go and and you know affect a bunch of other data structures right? It could put it into a bunch of stuff behind the scenes, right? Uh, so that is the main interface <coughs> to it. Um, and then this here. Oh no, that's not what I want to show you. Where is it? Yes. No. That is not what I wanted to show you. Although it's very similar. Uh, nope, not that guy. Uh, how I, you know what? I removed the request handler thing. That's brilliant. All right, let me just uh, show you this guy then. What's that? Uh, no, I, yeah, yeah, no, I, I actually, accidentally deleted a file that I didn't mean to delete here that just had the, uh, yeah, that just had the, the trait in it. Um, so I'll just show you that, which you're right, is actually, um, uh, it's Scala, so it doesn't actually have to have the same. Uh, oh, wow, no, I did something really stupid. Okay, so you know what I did? I accidentally, accidentally pasted some Scala code into, okay, anyway, I did something really goofy, but you can still kind of get the point. Um, this serious result, so, so really what this is, is for, in each of these request handling things, you actually, you just have to implement some code that handles a get, a put, and a delete, um, and then returns what we're calling a serious result that, you know, has some information as to whether, you know, either has the thing you were looking for or some information as to whether or not it succeeded. Um, it's a terrible, terrible example because it's not quite right, but I'll show you a better one in a second. Um, and then a serious result uh, is just this, right? So this is kind of uh, borrowing from option typing uh, in a way that works from Java. Um, you know, if you actually have something interesting to return, you return a sum with an in there. Uh, if you don't have anything interesting to return, you just return a none. And then if you have an error, you just, you know, you actually jam the, right, if an error happens on the request handling, right, null point or whatever, you jam it into uh, an error, you return, you know, that. You, you jam your, your exception into an error and return that. Um, so let me show you what uh, a simple sort of implementation of this actually looks like uh, with this guy here, which is kind of actually a little more useful. Um, oh, that's gonna happen. So, <clears throat> yeah. So this is, this is written in Java um, because uh, a lot of our middleware code is all written in Java, so we wanted to write uh, the library itself in Scala and be able to use it from Java, which is not uh, hard to do at all. Um, but this is implementing the request handler interface, which I wasn't able to show you because I accidentally overwrote it with some garbage. Um, and what it has is uh, a map of videos uh, keyed off of ID and a map of videos keyed off of um, movie. Uh, and then inside of the handle get, we just, you know, just do some simple stuff here. Pull the ID off of the key. Uh, if the key starts with movie, we know how we have to handle the movie request. Otherwise, we're handling a video request. Otherwise, we're throwing a you know, runtime exception that says, ah, we don't know what's going on, um, uh, which is actually the wrong thing to do there, but that's okay. Um, and, <clears throat> you know, handle movie request uh, just pulls it out of, pulls a handle movie request just goes and uh, actually pulls a uh, list of videos out of a map, you know, keyed off of movie ID, so that way you can get all of the videos associated with a particular movie. Handle video request uh, just pulls a video out of the, you know, the map keyed off a video ID if you want to get a particular video. And then down in handle put, there is some logic that deals with actually putting that stuff into those maps. Um, handle delete is the same. Uh, you know, it'll actually go and delete stuff out of those maps. 
Um, so that's essentially you know all you do rather than actually going and worrying about you know if, if this was uh, you know other you don't actually go and worry about okay I've got this data that I that I you know pulled into I actually have to go and where do I persist it where it just gets persisted as a log and you just worry about building the in-memory data structures you want to build and this is a really really goofy simple example just based off of maps you wouldn't actually structure the data like this but you know for the purpose of example it works uh, cool and then. Just one other thing I wanted to mention is, uh, obviously this is goofy, right? I've got kind of this if statement in here that, um, you know, tells you, like that's not gonna scale if you have lots and lots of different uh, services that you're worrying about putting in the same spot. Um, but, uh, so what we did was we sort of built a little bit of uh, a framework on top of that where you just implement like every path you wanna handle, you just, Toss a little annotation on it, and then implement a handle that handles stuff for just that path. Um, and that's pretty much it. Uh, so uh, I'm going to actually try and run this, which is always, uh, let's see. Uh, okay, so what I've got here is uh, the actual project. And what I've set up is a sort of demo three-node system all running on my laptop, which will hopefully not knock it over. It didn't before. Uh, there's a directory that it just drops like log files into here. Uh, oh, actually, let me. Yes, and I forgot to clean the old ones out. Uh, Sorry. Ah, no. Uh, yeah, by the way, it's always recommended that for live code demos, you run RM somewhere within a bash for loop. Uh, okay. Yes, that worked. Okay, excellent. Uh, okay. SBT. So I'm gonna actually just run this in uh, Scala's console just to show you, you know, show it working. Um, and of course it's all running locally on my laptop so it doesn't prove much but it kind of gives you the idea of, of what's going on here. Uh, all right, so console, start that up. And I have a, so I just have this, this is just uh, some, some nodes that are sort of pre-configured and hard-coded into this little goofy entry point. Uh, okay. Okay. And so that's actually starting up a bunch of actor systems and stuff and behind the scenes. Uh, and the other thing I put in here are just some sample videos, right? And we see this is just, you know, metadata for some really simple video. It's got an ID, it's associated with the movie, and it's got a title and a description. Um, <clears throat> Right, uh, same thing, another, another video that's associated with the same movie. Uh, so now if I go, I can go and put video slash one, video one, ah, two byte array. Okay, and then you see I get a, uh, this is just, Scala will actually uh, name, it, the, the, the shell actually does something really nice where it'll, whenever anything returns, if you don't name it, it'll automatically give it, you know, some default name. So that's what that res3 is. And you can see this is actually a future, right? So I can take a look at that and say, hey, are you done? Done, yeah, you're done. And then res3 dot get. Okay, and it says uh, none, so that means it worked, right? Because it doesn't have anything interesting to tell me. So now if I go and look on some other node, no, that's not gonna work. What did I call it? Ah. Q get video slash one. Okay, res six can't. And you can see that, and then it'll be on the other nodes. Uh, so, so yeah, so what you saw there is it actually went uh, it agreed on an order in the log for that particular update. 
replicated it to all the nodes, and then shot it into my little handling logic. Um, and there's a couple of other things I could do there, but you know, not that interesting. Um, so, so yeah, that, that's the general idea. Um, and let's close that before all these actor systems bring my laptop to a halt. And go back here real quick. Uh, why do I have a picture of John McCarthy? And that's a different slide. All right, sorry. Uh, oop, nope, definitely don't want to do that. Okay. So, yeah, reality check. Um, so there are obviously lots of trade-offs that you make when you do anything, especially something like this. Uh, one of them is that uh, the way this works is we're actually reading data out of uh, memory on local nodes. So that means that all the nodes aren't going to have the exact same view on the data, so it's, it's like eventually consistent, uh, which has um, been a fact of life for a lot of distributed systems. Uh, and, and luckily, you know, they're moving in the opposite direction right now, right? Like, people are starting to figure out how to wa ways to uh, uh, impose a, a lot stricter consistency on distributed systems. So this is, uh, you know, right, eventually consistent. Uh, that's okay for us, because that's things like writing videos and whatever into the system that are all these sort of back-end things, and, you know, nobody's really going to notice if they're a little off, um, you know, since we're really talking about uh, milliseconds. Uh, whereas, you know, if you went and put something in your shopping cart and then refresh the page and it's not there, that's a much bigger pain in the butt. Um, so, so, yeah, that's one thing. The other thing, obviously, we had to build this, so we, you know, had to, that took some effort. Uh, but not as much as you would think. Uh, I think we worked on this for like five or six months or so, uh, concurrent with building services built on top of it. So, um, you know, that's not a whole heck of a lot of time uh, when you, you know, we actually built stuff on top of it as we were building it. So, it, you know, uh, what else? Uh, so, the uh, another thing is uh, the the whole point of this was it's way more important for or one of the other points of this was that it's way more important for us to be able to serve, you know, to to sort of be up and serving requests than it is for us to be receiving updates for this particular thing because we don't, you know, if if a video is if a video doesn't get on the site for ten minutes or whatever, that's Okay, it's not great, but if we can't serve videos at all, that's awful. That's terrible. Um, so, uh, you know, hence serving data, you know, out of local memory. Even if there's like network partitions and you can't make progress on getting new stuff in, you can still go and serve requests out of uh, what you've already got in memory. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah. Any questions? <laughs> One more cat picture. <clears throat> what were the results in terms of scalability? Perhaps I missed it. If I, I did, I apologize. No, there was yeah. So so we just yeah. So we just deployed this into production. Um, the one uh, so it's taking a lot longer for us to serve requests than we expected because we organized the data poorly. Um, so it's taking on the order of like tens of milliseconds to get some of the stuff. So so really simple things we can serve out in you know sub millisecond with like sub millisecond latencies and. You know, we've got it running across uh, two clusters of three nodes each, and uh, you know, we actually haven't tried pushing those boxes to their limit yet. But uh, the the real problem right now for us is that we didn't organize the data particularly well, um, so it's taking like on the order of tens of milliseconds to serve like the stuff we actually care about. So we really need to go back and, and sort of reorganize the data structures that we have in memory before we can get like really good numbers on hey, how far can we push this thing? Um, so yeah, that was. You know, hindsight's twenty twenty, but organize your data right. <clears throat> mm -hmm. yeah, um, why is this scary? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not. You know, I, I wish I had uh, had a response to that because we like made that joke every day for the past six months. So like, I just don't have like a, a good response with it. But yes, I did want. I did want to put up a slide with uh, Heath Ledger somewhere, but too soon. So, yeah. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. Uh, I was wondering if you did any sort of scalability or throughput testing on just Aka itself. So 
a no op service, what the mm -hmm. number of transactions per second you could get out of a request for fly round trip was. Uh, sorry, can you repeat the question? Yeah, I was wondering if you did any uh, throughput testing on ACA itself. So uh, a no op service where you just have a request for fly, yeah. any request per second can you drive through the framework? Uh, yeah, we did, but um, you know, it depends on, it, it really, really depends on the hardware you're running it on is what it comes down to, obviously. Uh, so for like sort of a no op, um, uh, so, so actually, I did things where I threw a, a, a no op service, exactly like you're saying, up on, you know, just just to just for fun, up onto like some EC2 smalls, and it turns out that you know if it's not, like literally, the request handler is doing nothing; it's dropping the request on the floor, and I can only push like 10 requests per second through it, um, you know, with it, then that's doing the Paxos and every uh, Paxos and everything behind the scenes. Um, we went and put it on you know, somewhat beefier hardware, just boxes with like 16 gigs of memory and eight cores and that sort of thing, and we could get up to like 250, 300, uh, well, depending on what we were doing, we could get, yeah, somewhere around, it was around 300 uh, requests per second writing into the system. So that's actual writes that have to do with Paxos and, and all that. Uh, on the other side, um, that's, you know, reads is essentially entirely application specific and it depends on how you structure your data, which we did poorly. Um, so it's not as many uh, requests as we'd like until we go go back and clean that up. Yeah. <clears throat> um, but but yeah, I, I mean the you, you know for us like about 300 about 300 writes per second is fine um, because you know we're talking about we're talking about stuff that just doesn't change that often. Uh, obviously, for a lot of things that wouldn't be, this is the system is sort of really purpose built for this sort of. Uh, uh, you know, more, more static, uh, almost reference data than our user data. Um, and actually, our, our user data is still stored off in a key value store, right? And what our actual system looks like is a request comes in, and we do have to do, you know, one request out to get that user-specific data out of, you know, key value store, and then the rest of it is served out of memory. So, um, yeah. Any other questions? <laughs> Yes? No? Maybe? All right. Well, thanks for coming. <laughs>